to talk to you guys about space. So that's a big topic. Um, it's a topic that might seem a little bit distant, uh, a little bit out there, uh, but I want to suggest to you today that it's uh, a lot closer to you all than, than you might have realized when you walk through the door. So you may have heard the, the phrase that we're all made of stardust, and I want to um, suggest to you today that that uh, more than being just kind of a fairy tale statement, that that's actually a very literal statement. Uh, the iron in your blood, the calcium in your bones, was all manufactured inside of a star that exploded billions of years ago. And I think that's very beautiful and profound. And I think that it just really shows our connectedness to the cosmos and also to each other. So kind of it plays along that same image of the blue marble. You know, we're all connected, um, and we're all connected to space. And that's one of the things that, um, that I love about the work that I get to do at NASA. So on a more kind of day-to-day -day, uh, level, I wanted to talk a little bit about how the work that I do at NASA and the work that lots of others at NASA do is maybe similar to the work that a lot of you do in the sense that we are all working on problems, on challenges, and trying to find kind of creative, innovative solutions to problems. And for astronomers, uh, problems are questions. And that's one of the, the great things about, about being an astronomer is that these questions that we get to study, a lot of times are as old as humanity itself. It gets down to these big questions about, you know, when uh, the first humans uh, kind of looked up at the sky by, you know, when we started walking on two feet and, and looked up, you know, those big questions of what's out there and where did we come from and, and does space go on forever and are we alone? So a lot of the work that we do as astronomers gets to some of the, the details of those sorts of questions and that's why it's a lot of fun. Now to, to do that, of course, we have to build tools in all of our different works. We build tools to solve our problems. And the astronomer's quintessential tool is the telescope. Uh, so I want to start by talking a little bit about a very familiar telescope to most of us, the Hubble Space Telescope, my personal favorite telescope. All the, most of the research that I do um, is with data taken from Hubble. I study very distant galaxies, so how stars form in galaxies that are um, very far away. And so see some of these faint galaxies, we need a telescope in space, which is Hubble. So I'm going to take you on a quick journey of some of the amazing images that we've uh, seen from Hubble and some of the amazing things that we've learned. Of course, Hubble has um, studied uh, objects very close to us, objects within our own solar system like Jupiter. And then also just uh, going kind of out in space, Hubble studied regions of star formation. Um, stars, of course, are born inside dust clouds. And so after they're born, they shed off their dust, shine forth. And then stars, um, like everything else in our human experience, kind of, they live and then they die. And this is an example of a stellar death. So stellar deaths are often very uh, dramatic. So this is a supernova explosion. Um, and this is the mechanism by which the materials that are created inside of a star get sent out into interstellar space and eventually end up in planets and humans. Another example of a stellar explosion. So these images are very beautiful. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think the public loves Hubble. Uh, but there's a lot we can learn from these images as well. Now, of course, in addition to our own galaxy and all the stars and planets within our own galaxy, there are other galaxies. This is an example of one such. So these galaxies come in all different shapes and sizes. And occasionally, two galaxies will get close enough that they actually merge together. So this is an example of one of those cosmic galactic collisions Lots of fun things happen when galaxies collide. 
Uh, their black holes can collide, which is a very dramatic uh, kind of thing to happen in physics. And they form stars at amazing rates. And so this is one particular example of the types of galaxies that I study that are much more distant. And this is an example of a, a group of galaxies. So a lot of times when we think of galaxies, we think of kind of one galaxy setting out alone in space. But galaxies often group together in, in groups and clusters. And uh, almost every point of light you see in this particular image is a separate galaxy. And there's crazy stuff that goes on in the physics of these galaxy clusters where you get lots of galaxies packed in together. Um, up in the, I said I wasn't gonna use the laser, but here I'm gonna go, be a big dork. <laughs> All right, so this is actually a background galaxy. So this is general relativity in action. So when galaxies are in to together in these big clusters, the combined mass of all of the galaxies here and all the dark matter associated with those galaxies acts as a giant cosmic lens. And so what, it, what happens is that you have the galaxy cluster here, and then there's background galaxies behind the cluster, and the light from these galaxies gets physically bent by the mass of the galaxies. Crazy stuff, right? And so this is a, here's an example of a background galaxy that's been stretched and magnified and lensed by this cluster. So really cool physics that's going on uh, in these types of, of images. And if I had to pick a personal favorite image of all the ones that Hubble's taken, it would be this one. And this is the, uh, some of the data that I've done a lot of my own personal research on. This is the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This is the deepest image of the universe ever taken. So in this particular image, Hubble stared at the sky for about 11 days. And what you see here is 10,000 galaxies. So every little point of light almost in this image is an individual galaxy. So this is actually a tiny piece of sky though. If you hold out your pinky finger, you could cover up this piece of sky. So it's much smaller than the size of the full moon on the sky. So what that tells you, obviously, is that the universe is huge, right? This is a tiny little chunk of sky, and we see 10,000 galaxies. And astronomers now know that there are something like 100 billion other galaxies. So space is big, which is one of the things that uh, makes my job so fun. There's a lot out there that we don't know. So that's um, just a brief view of all the amazing things we've learned from Hubble. Hubble's been in orbit now uh, over 23 years, so it's been up there a long time. And it really isn't um, an overstatement to say that it has revolutionized our understanding of the universe. In a lot of fundamental ways, it's completely changed our understanding of how the universe works. So in that sense, it's been really just a phenomenal machine, a phenomenal tool of discovery that's helped us learn about the world that we live in. But there are a lot of ways in which we really pushed Hubble to its limits. It's still up there, it's still observing, I still use data from Hubble, and it's doing great. Um, but again, we need a new way to, to discover more about our universe. All of these great things that we've learned from Hubble have prompted new questions. And of course, that's how science proceeds. And so, uh, during the last 20 years of discovery with Hubble, those new questions have started to bubble up to the top. And whenever I talk about Hubble, I always like to make the point that this is your telescope. So in a sense, all of these big telescopes that NASA builds are somewhat open source, right? All the images that I've showed you are kind of freely available. You can go download them online. You can go download the raw data from Hubble if anyone has the desire to go do some astronomy research. Uh, it's all freely available online. Anyone in the world can propose to use Hubble. Uh, so it's very much a, a community telescope. Um, but again, it's been up there a long time, so we have to start thinking about what's next. Those are some of the kind of big questions 
that we're um, starting to think about that were outlined there. Uh, so this telescope that we're building at NASA is going to key in and start to uh, answer some of those big questions in astronomy that have bubbled up over time. And so we're really, really um, excited about this amazing telescope that we're building at NASA. It is um, some of the most advanced technology available today. We had to invent 10 brand new technologies um, just to make this telescope go forward. Um, I'm a scientist, so I'm really excited about the data that we'll get back from this telescope. Um, but for me, the, the engineering behind this, the design, the building of this thing, completely blows my mind. It, it is unlike um, anything I've ever seen. And it um, is, will be by far the most uh, complex and the biggest telescope that NASA's ever put into space. So it really is uh, pushing the boundaries of design and technology uh, to build a telescope like this. The telescope looks a little strange, right? You normally think of a telescope as a tube with a mirror at the, at the end, and that's what a lot of our telescopes in our normal experience are like, and that's what Hubble's like, right? Hubble's just a big, gigantic tube with a big, gigantic mirror. Um, but this telescope looks different, and that's one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit today about is about the design that goes into um, building a telescope like this and, and creating something and, and using kind of innovative design ideas in order to, to get to this machine that's going to attack our problems, which are the questions. Um, so Hubble looks a lot, or Webb looks a lot different than Hubble. I want to talk a little bit about some of those key differences and uh, why they're different. So the first big difference um, between Hubble and Webb is that this telescope is big. So this is a full-scale model of the telescope. Uh, this was actually taken at Goddard several years ago, part of the team that works on the telescope here. Um, it is gigantic. Again, biggest telescope NASA's ever put into space. Hubble, uh, to give you comparisons about the size of a school bus, uh, this thing is four stories tall, and this, uh, the gray sun shields here are about the size of a tennis court. So um, it is large, big telescope, and we need a big telescope to answer these big questions in astronomy that we have for today. So um, a really important thing about telescopes, of course, is the size of the mirror. And this is the size of Hubble's mirror, so kind of twice as tall as an average person. And the Webb mirror um, has about seven times the light collecting area. So that makes a big difference in um, observing the universe, both in how detailed um, we can see things, so how sharp that resolution is, and also just in how faint uh, things we can see. So all said and done, uh, Webb is going to be about 100 times more powerful than Hubble. So a lot of amazing things we're going to be able to learn with this telescope. The second key difference between Hubble and Webb is the kind of light that Webb will see. So Hubble sees the universe mainly in optical light, visual light that your eyes see. Webb will see the universe in infrared light, or light that's a little bit more red than your eyes can detect. Now, Webb will see a little bit into the visible part of the spectrum, a little bit red light, and then everything more red than that. And that is completely driven by the science questions. All of the big science questions we have in astronomy today um, will be answered by looking at the universe in infrared light. And then the third big difference uh, in between Hubble and Webb is where it's located in space. So Hubble orbits the Earth actually fairly close, about 350 miles up. It orbits the Earth once every 96 minutes. Uh, we're going to put Webb into deep space. So Webb will be a million miles from Earth, about four times further away than the moon. And we're putting it out in deep space so that it can get very, very cold. So infrared light, you can kind of think of it as heat radiation. And so the telescope itself, the mirrors, the cameras, um, all the instruments have to be very cold so that the telescope basically doesn't glow, doesn't see itself, so it can detect those faint infrared signals from the distant universe. So we're putting it out into deep space. Um, putting it there is uh, not really a problem. We ha NASA has several satellites out in that part of space right now. So getting, getting there is not the challenge. There are other big challenges in building a telescope like this. We'll launch from French Guiana. Uh, so that's why the countdown is in French here. So this is another rocket. Uh, we're going to launch on an Ariane 5 rocket. 
from French Guiana. Um, so that's um, uh, our partner, one of our partners in this telescope is the European Space Agency. And their heavy lifter, the Ariane 5, that spaceport, is down in South America in French Guiana. So we'll um, pack up the telescope, put it inside the rocket fairing that's shown here on the left side of the screen. Um, this telescope is so big, it's bigger than any rockets that we have to launch it in. So we have to build this telescope to fold up like origami and put it inside the rocket ferry and then it'll deploy once it gets into space. So again, complicated technologies going into the design of this telescope now. So we have really four main science themes, four big questions that we wanted to answer when we started thinking about how to build this telescope. And I want to talk about uh, those four things for just a few minutes. So the first thing we want to do is to see the very first galaxies that form. In this image, the most distant things that we can see are the little tiny red dots. They're actually even hard to see here. So there's just kind of a few pixels, little red dots. Um, and those are the most distant things we can see. And Hubble, again, can see back to fairly distant galaxies, but we are completely missing the very first epoch of galaxy formation. So those first galaxies that formed after the Big Bang can't see it all right now. There's no way. We don't have the technology. So we're building this telescope in order to see that very first epoch of galaxy formation in the early universe. Now we can, um, of course, build computer simulations uh, using physics of how we think this happened. Uh, we have a lot of good information about how we think the Big Bang actually started. And so we can, we can take that starting point and just with physics kind of evolve it um, in order to see what we think happened in the very early universe. This is just a computer simulation that shows um, how we think those first galaxies formed. Um, but again, part of astronomy, of course, a big part of astronomy is not only simulating what happens, but observing what happens. And we can't see these galaxies yet. We'll be able to see them with Webb. So really exciting stuff there. The second big thing we want to do is we want to watch galaxies assemble over time. So when you think of galaxies, you probably think of something like the Milky Way, right? Something with big spiral arms, lots of very organized structure. And lots of galaxies in the present day universe are like that. They're big, uh, they have lots of structure. But when we start looking into the distant universe, we see a completely different picture. We see galaxies that are very small, um, they're clumpy, they don't have a lot of formation. So that question of how we go from those tiny unformed things to the large structures we have in the present day universe is still a big open question in astronomy. There's a lot about that process that we don't know, and this telescope is gonna help us learn a lot about that. Now, um, this is, a, again, another computer simulation that shows one of the processes by which we think this happens. So um, I've already shown you some pictures from Hubble of galaxy mergers. So um, again, we can use physics to figure out what happens to the stars and the gas in galaxies. Uh, when two galaxies collide. And so this is a simulation that shows how um, that happens. This is really important um, in the overall buildup of galaxies over time. Um, another one of the kind of big puzzles in astronomy is how black holes got so big. Um, so there are very massive black holes, like a billion times the mass of the sun, at the center of most large galaxies. And how they got that big is still an open question. We think this is an important part of that process, but there's still a lot about that we don't know. Um, so that's, again, one of those big open questions in astronomy today. Now, we can use uh, Hubble data to learn a little bit about this. So this is examples of real data, real Hubble images, that are kind of snapshots in time. So that whole process of two galaxies colliding takes billions of years. Um, so this is a snapshot that shows um, of how we can observe kind of different stages in that overall process. And um, that's uh, really interesting to me. That's a lot of what I work on. So the third main theme is we want to see how stars are born. Now, we know that stars are born inside dust clouds. This is a iconic image from Hubble. Stars are born inside big uh, regions of gas and dust like this. This is a visible a Hubble image um, of that gas and dust. It just faded to infrared. So what you see is that infrared light allows us to peer inside the dust and see the stars actually being formed. So lots of things we can learn from infrared light um, with this new telescope. And then the fourth theme, which is fairly 
far away from what I study, so I study very distant galaxies. Um, but this theme for me is one of the most exciting because we are going to be able with this telescope to literally study other planets outside of our own solar system, so exoplanets, these other worlds that we know exist. So we know a lot of them are out there. Actually, there are over a thousand of these exoplanet candidates that exist. Um, and here's a new, uh, just a chart that shows how we find them. So the Kepler Space Telescope, NASA's Kepler, um, has observed a lot of these. And, and what Kepler does, and what lots of telescopes that detect these types of systems do, is they stare at a star and wait for the light to go down. And when the light goes down, uh, gets a little bit fainter, that means a planet has likely passed in front. So right now we know that a lot of these candidates exist, we know they're there, but we don't know a lot about them. So this telescope is going to allow us to completely open up that era or that, that area of exoplanet science. So just to give you a little example, Webb will have the capability to detect water vapor in the atmospheres of some of these exoplanets. So really it's going to um, perhaps revolutionize our understanding of exoplanets. So exciting stuff here. Um, and then of course we always you know, plan out all these great big awesome questions. But one of the most fun things about a telescope like this are the questions that we haven't even thought to ask yet. So there are all those surprises that are out there that we haven't thought of yet. And as a scientist, this is one of the, the most fun things about my work. Um, this is just a, a pie chart um, that shows the composition of the universe. And this is just to make the point that we don't know what 95% of the universe is made of. So that would uh, be the stuff that astronomers call dark energy and dark matter. Don't know what it is. Um, everything you're familiar with, you, yourselves, your planets, all of the things I've showed you, galaxies, stars, everything, is only 5% of the stuff that makes up the universe. So we have a lot yet to learn, which is what makes it so exciting. And so the great news is we're building this telescope right now. In fact, we already have um, much of the hardware, much of the pieces built. Um, so these are the iconic gold-coated mirrors of the Webb telescope, coated in gold. Uh, so that it can reflect infrared light. Um, so the, all the mirrors themselves have been uh, built, have been manufactured, and being delivered to Goddard right now. So we have half of our flight mirrors that have been delivered to Goddard. Um, so it just provides a lot of great opportunities for, um, for learning about the technology that goes into building these telescopes. This is the back plane structure of the telescope, the big thing that holds all the mirrors. So again, you can start to get a little bit of a sense of scale of how big this telescope is. Um, manufacturing the sun shields, this is going on down in Alabama at the Marshall Space Flight Center. This is a test element of the sun shield. This is one of the structures. This is actually the flight hardware that's out at Goddard right now. This will house the instruments that the, um, that the telescope will have. So just lots of great things going on. This is also at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, um, a, a test element of the telescope going down into our gigantic thermal vacuum chamber. So lots of great things going on here. Um, so it's such a, an honor and a privilege for me as an astronomer to get to work on this amazing machine. This is one of NASA's top three overall priorities. Um, and again, it's, it's really pushing the boundaries of, of um, what we can do in engineering. Um, we're, we have to do hard things in order to get this telescope to work. And um, it's going to be worth it because we're going to answer those big questions in astronomy, um, which is one of the great things about uh, being an astronomer is to look forward to all of those great questions uh, that we'll get to answer in the future. Thanks. <laughs>